<laughs> What's happening? Oh yeah. Ain't nobody signed up with Mr. Slip for me. Oh yeah. I ain't know that. With all the little youngins out there, that's cool. I, oh, well, they're cool. Hey, well, they're cool. They ain't got to with me, but I ain't signing no permission slip nowhere. That ain't what I do. Where there's money to be made, the underworld normally isn't far behind. Whether they're laundering through seemingly legitimate businesses or rubbing shoulders with politicians to favor their causes, the world of organized crime is everywhere. And when you consider just how profitable hip hop is, it's no surprise that the underlying element of gang violence shows itself in the lives of artists. Commonly referred to as the Black Hand, the roots of extortion crime groups can be traced back as far as 1750s Naples. In those days, the local mafia would send a letter to businesses threatening violence or property damage to get protection money from the owner. As the mafia made their way to America, extortion took hold in the inner cities with Chicago, New York, and Philly experiencing regular shakedowns that scared anyone who didn't comply. Unsurprisingly, these mafia methods were taken on by other street organizations, and now extortion is as much a part of hip-hop than ever before. At this point, any street rapper will know that checking in is part of the job. This is essentially a sign of respect that makes sure an artist can move through the city without fears of being punked or murdered. At its core, this practice is mutually beneficial, with the rapper getting a free hood pass, all while investing money into the city by paying a fee to them through security or allowing an up-and-coming artist to open for them at their show. Though it might seem unjust, it's better than the alternative. So now that we're caught up to speed, let's take a look at some of the most infamous incidents where rappers were extorted. While he's a successful billionaire today, even Kanye West wasn't safe from extortion. During a trip to Philadelphia, Ye, who was regarded as more of a suburban rapper than a thug, had to call up the Broad Street bully, Beanie Siegel, to help him get out of a tough spot. He felt threatened. Nothing was going to happen to him. Not while I was there. They had chairs pulled up to his table where he was eating at with his friends, and they wasn't eating. And it was real. They played the food. It was cold. It was just like a, a weight off. Like, hurry up, and when you come out of here, it's going down. So when I got to ask Kanye, yo, do you know this guy right here? It was like, nah. Kanye had his jewelry tucked in on Take your chain out. That was like a badge, that Rockefeller chain. It was the family. So taken from him at that time was like taken from me. And where Beanie was able to help Ye navigate out of trouble without any harm, other artists haven't always escaped their reputation or possessions intact. Out of all the places where checking in is practice, nowhere moves with more organization than Detroit. Headed up by Trick Trick, the Motor City is operated as a no-fly zone. And as he explained to Nori on Drink Champs, it's used to make sure the city and its people get their due respect. Damn, what is the No Fly Zone? It was for record labels. Okay. When record labels used to have like street teams, and <laughs> that was back in the A&R days. <laughs> they would have a promo team, huh. take the artists to different locations, and it was like they were just coming to Detroit and wasn't picking up nothing. They would charge the local artists to perform. When it kept happening with the little homies, and they mm -hmm. was just doing it because they got money, mm -hmm. like, you know, that man stop everything wow. and the only entertainment around this gonna be what's here mm. and if anybody violate it mm. we'll deal with that accordingly right. out of everyone who's faced the impact of this no one had their ticket denied as publicly as rick ross set to headline a summer jam event in the city rose's bag was stopped by the local guardians who enforced the no fly zone did you know that on average there are around five million car accidents every year in the u.s and a lot of those accidents happen during the holiday season even worse, a lot of victims don't feel comfortable suing for damages because they're under the mistaken impression that they'd be suing the other driver, a regular human just like them. Injuries sustained in a car accident are just one of the things Morgan & Morgan can help you with. They're the largest injury law firm in America, and they're fully equipped to handle injuries of any nature that may entitle you to compensation. That includes car accidents, workplace injury, medical malpractice, and more. They have over 100 offices nationwide, 800 lawyers, and thousands of case staff. That means you don't just get a lawyer assigned to your case, you get a whole legal team ready to fight for your fair compensation. But don't feel bad for suing. When you sue for injury, you're not suing the middle-aged man who nodded off in the driver's seat, you're suing his insurance company, who are sitting on billions of dollars in profit every year. They're using every resource they have to avoid paying out because that's their job. So why shouldn't you do the same? The best part is Morgan & Morgan only charges you a fee if you win the case. That's right. No matter how many hours of work they put in, if you lose, you pay them nothing. So if you've been injured, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. Their fee is free unless you win. For more information, go to ForThePeople.com backslash Hip Hop Madness or dial Pound Law, pound 529. With that said, let's get back to the video. We have Rick Ross right outside here. 
tonight. When he was pulling up to come into Shane Park, he was met by a hundred individuals outside. We have tried to pull every resource together and ask him to come back. He is in fear of his life, and he may never come back to Detroit. While Rosé's situation has lived on in infamy, he wasn't the only artist to fall in Trick Trick's territory. One notable example of a rapper being caught on camera snubbing extorters is the baby. During a video shoot for his single, 21, in East Atlanta, the North Carolina native was confronted by a local gang who set out to intimidate him for trespassing. Hey, if you wanted to come politic, you could've came in politic. He could've just came in politic. You know, that was real Dude, I ain't no peewee. I ain't no peewee though. So we don't, it don't go like that. It gotta be respect. I would have got the utmost respect. Just don't do it like that. I don't ask the questions. I don't stop permission slipping. I don't do that, big homie. You could have came and chopped it. Okay. An incident where he dealt with this surprisingly well, the baby has since admitted that it could have went badly, but not necessarily for him. The guy was on his side. It worked out perfect for him. Everybody Crew. else was yeah. doing it, was was there to do a job. They were scared as f Where the baby responded with anger. Others have said that extortion is not always something to stay away from, as it can make your life much easier. In Joe Budden's opinion, checking in was always a failsafe, with the rapper turned podcaster explaining that it's a necessary evil. This is how I explain it. State taxes. Checking in is state taxes. I don't live in LA, but I've done work in LA. And at the end of the year, LA sends a note to my house that tells me how much money I owe them. That's the government. The street people that are powerful enough to control movement in their town, i.e. Big U, Trick Trick, whoever these names are, all of y'all artists come to these cities and take, 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 and make money all year long without giving back. So to avoid the streets getting it from you how they want to get it from you, I'll fix all that. But there's a fee attached. That's how I view it. I didn't grow up with you. I don't know you. you I don't tax. know none of them. I don't really care about your well-being, but you're going to pay. All right, he's good for these three days that he's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Another artist who's made his peace with extortion is none other than Vanilla Ice. Grossing more revenue than most hip-hop artists see in their entire careers, Vanilla Ice was so successful that he unwillingly went on to fund one of the biggest labels in hip-hop history. Not exactly known for his tactful business operations, Suge Knight knew that when it was time to find funding to start up Death Row Records, who better to raise funds from than one of the industry's richest industry plants who was now living it up in LA. And although the claims that he was dangled over a balcony by Suge and Death Row goons has been blown out of proportion, Vanilla Ice viewed the shakedown in a more positive way. You know, he took that money, and I look at it in a positive way. With me, people think I'm bitter about it. To me, I look at it in a positive way, saying, you know what? That money went on to start Death Row Records. That money funded some of the greatest hip-hop music of our time. The mm -hmm. Chronic Record, funded by the Vanilla Ice. Nobody ever thought about that. How about Snoop Dogg, funded mm -hmm. by Vanilla Ice? How about Tupac, funded mm -hmm. by Vanilla Ice? I may not have had a good return on my money <laughs> <laughs> on that one, but listen to me. It went on to do something good in the hip-hop community, man. All right. When we're talking about extortion in hip-hop, it's impossible not to mention Houston's Jay Prince. Often seen as hip-hop's overarching kingpin who uses intimidation to end potential conflicts before they even get off the ground, the rap -a lot Records CEO is almost universally respected. But with that said, everyone slips up sometimes, and his attempts to move in silence have been violated. Even though he appeared to be charitably returning NBA Youngboy's possessions to him after a robbery, many people suggested that it was an outright attempt to extort a rapper who refused to pay their respects to him. The little homie Youngboy place got broke into, you know, I got a call about it. And the little homies that went into this place want to make that right. I got your keys to your Rolls Royce. I got your keys to your McLaren. You know, all that that they took. All good, waiting on you. In classically bold fashion from the Baton Rouge rapper, young boy wouldn't bend to the pressure, responding with a fiery message of his own. I don't want no friends. I don't want no new relationships. If you got something for me, man, they got plenty of around me you could call you don't get on no internet and do nothing publicly none of that i'm good on keys gangster when you buy cash two two keys come with the car anyway mind your business man where young boy escaped unscathed the reason that there were likely no consequence for him shooting off at the mouth is that he wasn't indebted to prince an extremely imposing figure, Prince's presence has even led to the downfall of one of the most prolific rejections of checking culture that we've seen in hip hop. During the peak of his powers before being outed as a rat, Takashi69 took great pleasure in dissing checking culture, even going as far as to dub his tour the Test of My Gangster Tour. 
Yo, I'm gonna say this right now. There's gangsters all over this world. I don't check into nobody. I respect everybody's soil that I walk on, but I do not check in anywhere I go. And it's gonna stay like that, you know what I'm saying? Made even more bold by his connections to the nine Trey gangster bloods, Takashi actively welcomed problems as he went to other cities, believing that he was untouchable. You see me, I invite you to test my gangster. But the problem, Straight up, you... nobody want this problem. I'm telling you right now, y'all interview so many rappers. If I say I'm the king of New York for the 500th time, and someone didn't like it, that something could have easily happened. You're not the king of New York. I'm the king of New York. Like Everywhere I go, they shut it down like the president's coming. Like they At the time, Takashi's willingness to go everywhere he wanted was crucial in building the mythology around him, not to mention the image that influenced millions of people to follow his Instagram to stay up to date with the tour. But even Takashi wasn't immune to the powers of Prince and his extended family. During a visit to Texas, 6 9 was forced to no-show a performance due to the presence of Jay Prince Jr. and his Mob Ties crew. Talk a lot of shit, huh? Yes. But won't even show up to their own show. You don't want your back in? Oh Where's 6 9 then? After the fact, Jay Prince didn't necessarily endorse his son's actions, but implied that they were a direct response to the bold behavior that he's shown in other cities. It's hard when a man, you know, is campaigning the way this this guy campaigned. Eventually, he's going to get elected. You can't have a man beside you with all that campaigning. And a bullet might fly from somewhere and hit the wrong person. So you want to get an understanding with these kind of people before you allow them to sit in your car, stand beside you. I understood. Since getting out of jail, Takashi has prevented similar problems by siding with a known extorter, WAC 100. At this point, WAC's gang ties in L.A. are an open secret with academics even joking about it in a November 2021 IG post which read, when you just paid your 15k a month extortion money to at WAC 100 to keep the goons off you. Between the constantly broken borders between the worlds of hip-hop and criminality, extortion isn't likely to go anywhere soon. And whenever street artists move into uncharted territory and expect to make money, you can bet that there'll be some locals looking for a piece of the action.